Can you think back to what you got for Christmas last year? What about the Christmas before that? Do you remember what you got that Christmas? I, I, I remember uh, two Christmas gifts from my childhood. Sorry, Mom and Dad. Um, Red Ryder BB gun, of course. Hint to what Silas might be getting for Christmas. And a, a Lego set called Fort Legorito, which was this like cool castle of a fort of Western Legos. And that's it. And I think this exercise teaches us a little bit about the lie of consumerism. When we can't think back to what we got for Christmas. See, we want something so badly in life oftentimes. And when we receive whatever that material good is, we feel happy for a while. But after a while, the happiness fades and we need something else. We need something new to keep up our happiness. This is the lie consumerism teaches us on a macro level. And this uh, fits perfectly to our series, The Words on Christmas, where we talk about and we're talking about these words we often hear around Christmas, love, joy, hope, and peace, and what they actually mean. So last week, we looked at hope. This week, we will look at joy. And I think oftentimes when we think of joy, we can't actually conceive in our minds what joy is. So the word we settle for is happiness. Happiness is part of the American ethos, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is part of the American DNA. As Americans, we will do anything to justify or pursue happiness. We buy cars, we build homes, we go on vacations, we buy large TVs, and, after, and for a while we are happy. But happiness, as it turns out, is such a fleeting feeling. So many times in our search for deeper happiness, we turn to indulgences, to lusts of the flesh, to greeds of the hearts, to substances to make us happy. In fact, the blockbuster movie, The Pursuit of Happiness, reminds us just how deeply flawed we are as Americans when it comes to this. Because the solution to the uh, homeless dad was to get a job on Welsh, Wall Street that would make him wealthy. So let me just give you a few observations I have of what this pursuit of happiness looks like in our state and how we're doing with it. It seems now that in our push for greed, we're like, how can we make more money? So what do we do? We legalize more gambling. You can gamble now off your smartphones. You have more opportunities to gamble. Consider the lusts of the flesh. Pornography is more accessible than it has ever been. And now there's a politician in our state who is campaigning for the legalization of prostitution, saying sex work is real work. In Colorado, our goal is to legalize every substance. First, we started with marijuana, a depressant. Then we're like, how can we get alcohol more accessible? We'll, we'll do deliveries. We'll put it in grocery stores. Then we're like, hey, let's get the mushrooms out there. We need some mushrooms. That'll really help us. And now a youth group kid that Aubrey and I grew up with, who is now an attorney, is part of a group trying to legalize meth in our state. So... How's this all working for us? Not well, right? It is not going well for us. By every metric I can come across, all of them say we are more sad, lonely, depressed, isolated than at any other point in American history. We are struggling. We need to come to the conclusion as Americans that we have a happiness problem. But there is a solution. And you've come to the right place to find the solution this morning. So will you go to me in prayer as we seek out the solution? God, we come before you seeing our society's brokenness and the pursuit of happiness. And so we come to you because we need more. We are in search of something deeper, something more sustaining. So I pray that your spirit will come and fill our hearts this Christmas with joy, that your joy would be the strength that sustains us, that fills our hearts, that carries us on in all seasons of life. So to that end, pour through me the gift of preaching that Christ may be formed in hearts. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. So I need to take you back to year zero. 
What an amazing number. What an amazing year to be alive. And I don't think we can even imagine how difficult it was to live in year zero. The loss of freedom for the Israelites due to Jewish occupa- or Roman occupation, all the taxation that they were facing as they're feeding the Roman Empire and fueling it, all the rituals and laws of Mosaic law that they were required to fulfill in order to be considered a good Jew. But on top of that, there was the bureaucracy of the Sadducees. That they had to do all these extra things on top of it in order to live their faith. And then there's also the Pharisees. The Pharisees who are saying, this isn't enough. See, they're, they're, they're being tempted, the Jews, of assimilation into Roman culture. So the Pharisees are like, well, let's add more rules and more laws on top of it. And the lowest of all these people, the lowest of all these people were some shepherds with the night watch. Just out there for another night, working on the night shift, trying to make sure no one came and stole their sheep. Trying to make sure that no wild animals were going to get after them. And the question looms in year zero, where is God? What is God going to do with all this brokenness, with all this hurt, with all this pain, with all this oppression? And piercing through the darkness of night came God's answer And it sounded like this. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. The light in the darkness was shining so brightly that it was startling to these shepherds. But the angel told them, no, no, no. This is not a time to be afraid. But it's the time to find joy. But not just regular joy, great joy. And who's this joy for? This joy is for all people. The incarnation is joy that a new king is in town. That the world's wicked ways of doing things are numbered. Joy filled their hearts because this king wasn't born on a mansion on this hill. This king would be born in a feeding trough for livestock. This was the sign of not only who this king is, but what his kingdom would be like and who this kingdom is for. So the question we are seeking to answer today is what is biblical joy? When we look at the Bible, what does it mean to be joyful? And I think the first answer comes from Exodus. After hundreds of years of slavery, of hoping and wishing that God would see them and do something about it, God miraculously delivers them with the ten plagues, with the crossing of the Red Sea. And after events like this, they they had this great joy in their heart. So it's described in the Psalms, looking back and reflecting on these events, and it says, He brought His people out with rejoicing, His chosen ones with shouts of joy. This joy was a defining moment for them and for us because it was to say that their joy was not determined by their current circumstances, but their joy was determined by their future destiny. This joy would carry Israel through many difficult seasons. One such season season of occupation came in the form of a prophecy. In Isaiah 51, it looks like this. The, those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. What a beautiful image. And so they waited and they hoped, like we talked about last week, with this tension and anticipation for a future redemption. And that is why the significance when Jesus was born is so important. That it was announced that this is good news of great joy for all people. This joy they had hoped for was now here in the flesh. Jesus came to bring this joy. He even taught his disciples how to live with this joy. In Matthew 5, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. 
For the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. After Jesus' death and resurrection, Jesus sent his followers to share the good news. And although they faced heavy persecution, they went forward as it says in Acts chapter 13. And the disciples, disciples were filled with joy. With joy in the Holy Spirit in the face of this persecution. And so they continued on. This is what allowed Paul this joy while facing future death, his execution and imprisonment, imprisonment to have joy of faith as it's described in Philippians chapter 1. For Paul, the joy of the Lord is God's presence with you in the midst of hardship. So when you believe that Jesus' love has overcome death itself, joy becomes your, uh, what you can hold to. It becomes reasonable in every circumstance because Jesus has defeated death. And so for Paul, this doesn't mean suppressing sorrow. Paul often expresses his grief about missing loved ones, about losing friends, or even his own freedom. But Paul describes this joy in a really unique way in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Poor, yet making many rich. Having nothing, and yet possessing everything. Paul teaches us something about joy. Paul is, is, is an example of how he acknowledges his pain in life, but also makes the decision to trust Jesus. That this pain that he is currently feeling will not be the final word. So can you see that this is very different from the advice we're oft, often given of turn that frown upside down. Joy has a very different manifestation in our life. Biblical joy is a profound decision of faith and hope in the power of Jesus' life and love. So I'm worried this sounds too theoretical now. A little too pie in the sky. Practically, how does this joy work in our life? Because happiness, we know, is such a fleeting emotion. How can we find something more sustainable? And I think the answer comes from Nehemiah chapter 8. It's in the Old Testament. They've gone back to Jerusalem. They're going back there and they are hearing God's commands read aloud for the first time after being in exile. And they are convicted of just how far they are from God's ways, of all the sin in their life, of all the brokenness, of how they need to change. And they find themselves hanging their heads. They're down and depressed on themselves, on where they're at in life, a feeling we can relate to all too often in our own lives. And Nehemiah, Nehemiah responds to them, to seeing them hanging their heads. And he says, no, 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 no. Let's go back to that slide. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's what he told them. God's joy gives us strength. Because when God is our source of joy above all the other forms of happiness in this world, we cannot help but have strength. Using the joy of the Lord as our strength means looking at all the things this world has to offer and realizing none of them come close to comparing the to the joy that Jesus Christ our Lord gives us. And so let me flesh out further what it looks like to live in this joy. Joy is not worried about fleeting emotions of happiness or of sorrow. Joy sees the bigger picture. Joy is not having to seek to define someone else or define ourselves by our, our worldly standard, but joy defines ourselves as a child of God. Joy does not prevent or avoid the season of doubt or grief or depression, but joy goes through us with it. In seasons, seasons of loss that we know all too well, joy is not used to avoid the grief. Joy walks through us in the grief. Joy is not set on our own imperfection tearing us down. No, joy delights in the perfect one who is reconciling us to him. Are you starting to see what this looks like in our lives now? So as Christians... As Christians, we are to be the most joyful people on the planet. And let me tell you, 
If Christianity isn't producing this kind of joy in your life, you're doing it wrong. Let me be very blunt with that. I can't help but think of interactions I've had with legalistic Christians, and they have something in common. They are miserable. They lack joy in their lives because they are miserable trying to go around to leave, uh, live some legalistic set of rules according to their specifications. Let me tell you of one such example I had this week when I was buying food for date night. I'm walking down the aisles, getting some of the colored pencils, and I hear two ladies talking, catching up over one of them's family members who's really struggling struggling with religion. He's gotten involved with a pretty uh, legalistic group. And she tells her friend, well, you know those Church of Christ people, they believe they're the only ones going to heaven. And I immediately start looking around for all you guys because I think you've put me up to this prank or something. <laughs> so I go around the aisles and I'm like, what's going on there? And she's talking about another church in town. And I thought, well, I won't correct her because I think she's actually right on what they believe. She goes, yeah, but that other church in Poncha, they're not quite like that. I said, oh, we'll take it. Well, it's a little bit of improvement, right? But they were looking at this family member's life and how they're living out their faith. And they saw no joy. No joy. And I think about and I reflect on the mentors in my life, the people of faith, all of them Church of Christ. And they are some of the most joyful, loving, caring people that I have ever been around. And that is how I want and seek to live my life. See, joy prevents us from having to fake the aches in life. It sets us free. Instead, we can come together and we can smile when we have joy. Not because of our present circumstances, but because our joy is found in God. So we get to come to church and we might feel happy or we might feel sad, but we don't have to turn that frown upside down. No, no, joy gives us the courage to say, I'm hurting, I'm struggling, I need help, I'm going through trials, I have some pain in my life, but we come together in joy saying, no, 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 there is more to this feeling of sadness, there is a greater, there is a deeper joy, there is more purpose and meaning to live. To live, And here's how I know all of this is possible. Because in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, when describing Christ and what Christ went through for us, it says this, for the joy set before him. He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. How did Jesus have the strength to go to the cross? Hebrews tells us it was joy. Joy is what gave him the strength to go to the cross. The joy of the Lord is defeating our brokenness. The joy of the Lord is reconciling himself to us. The joy of the Lord is giving us true freedom. And this is why we celebrate a little baby sitting in a manger. Because Emmanuel, God with us, came to earth to take on all of our sin, to take on all of our shame. Everything this world could throw at him, even if it meant being executed on a cross. And it was his joy. It was his joy to do this for you and I. And for that reason, he is seated on the throne with God. So if God's joy could do that, then how could this joy give us strength in our life? That's what I want to end on. As you open up your Christmas gifts this year, let me offer you a better gift. Because one day those gifts won't make you as happy as they do today. One day after the vacation, you'll still be stressed. One day after the su- one day the substances won't numb the pain. One day the greeds of your heart and the lust of the flesh will never be enough. So instead, I bring to you this Christmas good news. Good news that will swell up into your heart to make an amount to great joy. The good news of a God who loved you enough to share himself with you. 
to conform to this mortal world in order to defeat, defeat sin and death for us. Something we couldn't even do for ourselves. So do you want this joy of the Lord? Well, let me invite you this morning to live into this joy. You want to know the first thing you can do? You can smile during worship services. Do you know that's so loud? Sometimes you guys look at me like you're about to go to the dentist or something. Like, you know, like not too joyful. You are loud when you are worshiping God, when you are taking communion, when you are hearing the word of God proclaimed, you are allowed to smile. But let's go deeper than that. Here's what I ask you that you would pray for this week. I ask that you would pray for the way that be, you'd be convicted with the Holy Spirit and the ways in your life where you maybe aren't living into this joy. Where God needs to come in and change something in your heart and replace those other things that need to go away with joy in your heart. Some of us, I believe, have been sitting on the fence for a while when it comes to this Jesus thing, and I hope some would find it in their hearts to put their faith in Jesus, to take him on in baptism so they can fully live into this joy. And some of you might be visiting or new to this story. And if so, please find myself or one of the elders after service. And we would love to sit and study with you more and talk about this joy. But in a second, I'm going to ask you all to stand. Stand in response to the sermon and we will sing together. Sing a song called Joy to the World. This song we are going to sing uh, was never intended actually to be a Christmas carol. The hymn writer Isaac Watts wrote it in 1719. The great hymn writer Isaac Watts wrote this song in reference to Psalm 98, which uh, King David wrote about, talking about seasons of great joy. But... There was a chorus getting together. They were doing performances and they needed a new Christmas song. And they're like, well, this Joy to the World song, that could be pretty cool in a Christmas, you know, uh, choir concert. And so they threw it in and it was a hit. Everyone loved it. They're like, this is a great Christmas carol. It stuck. They went with it. But here's what's interesting to me about the song. In John's gospel, the way John describes all the wickedness and evil forces of the world is by calling it the world. Whenever John says the world, he's talking about the brokenness, the evil, the shame, the guilt, all those kind of forces and brokenness and evil uh, desires in the world. And then all of a sudden you get to the third chapter of John. And you get this really crazy realization that for God so loved the world. He so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's great joy. That is great joy. And you read a few verses down and it says, this is the joy. The joy of the world is that God did not send his son to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That he could have condemned us all, that he could have wiped us out, he could have started over. But no, I'm going to save him. And that is the beauty of Christmas. That is what gives us great joy. And so church, may we sing with great joy. May you leave here today with joy instead of happiness because God sent his only son because he loves you. Will you stand with me as we sing Joy to the World?